Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. You know, some of the most common questions I receive are about mixers. What a mixer is, what it does, what all those controls do on the front panel. And it can be intimidating when you step up to a mixer for the first time. There are all those controls laid out. You don't know what each one does, and you don't want to mess anything up when you're mixing live sound or you're working in the studio. So in this video, we'll be introducing mixers to you. We'll be talking about the controls, the channel strip, how the signal flows through, everything that goes into using a mixer to create a great sounding mix, whether you're on stage or you're in the studio. Now the first thing to keep in mind when you're checking out a mixer for the first time is that although it looks intimidating with all those controls, there's actually a lot of repetition here. So we have a channel strip. The signal comes in the top, flows down through all these controls, down to the fader at the bottom, and then it's routed over here to the master section and back out to speakers or a recorder or wherever it may be going. But each of the channel strips after that actually duplicates those same controls. So once we learn one channel strip, we've basically learned the entire mixer. Let's start at the top and look at how signal comes into a mixer like this. One other thing to keep in mind is that we have analog mixers, we have digital mixers, and they really do the same thing. It's just where the controls are located that may be different. On an analog console like this Mackie Pro FX12 V3, all the controls are right here on the front panel and instantly accessible. In a digital console, some of those controls may be in menus, you may have a single channel strip that is assigned to the different channels and so on, but all the functionality, all the concepts are exactly the same. Let's talk first about getting signal into the mixer. At the top of each channel strip, we have a jack for connecting our sources. Now on the first two jacks here, we have combi jacks. These accept both XLR as well as quarter inch cables, so you could connect a microphone, a line level source like a keyboard or a music player, or even a guitar into those channels. On channels 3 through 10, we have separate XLR connections for our microphones, as well as a separate connection for our line level inputs. The input jack works in conjunction with the gain control, which is sometimes called a trim control, to set the incoming level for that signal. So let's check this out with three different sources. With a microphone like the Shure SM58, typically you'll have an XLR or a 3-pin jack, and that plugs right in at the top here. Now once we have that signal coming in, we can adjust our gain until we see the indicator light. Not all mixers will have that indicator light. Some of them will just have an overload light that'll glow red if you're putting in too hot of a signal. But there'll usually be some way to indicate that you've got signal coming into the channel. Now at this point, there's no sound coming through the mixer yet. The sound is coming into the top of the channel strip, but it hasn't been routed anywhere. To get sound out of the mixer, we need to bring up the fader, which is the volume control at the bottom. Then we'll also hit the left-right switch in this case. You may or may not have to do that depending on your mixer. But in this case, the left-right switch assigns us to the main output over here. Now we can see our meters are moving and you can hear the sound coming through the mixer. We could also bring a line level source in using those same connections or using the line level connections here on the different channels. So I'll plug into channels 3 and 4. The signal's coming from my computer and it's playing a drum loop. Now we set our levels in the same way. We bring up our gain control. But again, to hear the signal, we're going to need to push up our channel faders, hit our left right buttons, and move up the main output. We can adjust things so we're getting a good strong signal on our meters. Typically what you want to do is set the gain control so that your faders are up to where you have plenty of room to move them both up and down. This allows you to create an effective mix later. And of course you can adjust that gain control later. If you're overloading, you don't have enough signal, you can always reach up and tweak that. Now this is a stereo source, so we'll want to pan this left and right so we can hear the different elements across the stereo field. To do that, we simply adjust the pan controls on each channel, move one to the right and one to the left. Our final input type would be instrument level, which would typically be an electric guitar, an electric bass, or maybe an acoustic guitar. To connect this on the Mackie, we go back to our first channel, which has a high Z input. Now that high Z input is very important because the pickups want to see high Z in order to sound their best. So in this case, we plug into the quarter inch connection, hit the high Z switch, bring up our fader, assign to the left right, adjust our gain control. <laughs> To explore the rest of the channel strip, let's go back to our drum loop. So I've got it playing from my computer here. We've got our gain adjusted. We'll bring that up so you can hear that it's feeding through our main outputs. Now we can mute this so we don't have to listen to it by simply hitting the mute switches. But we have other functions in this mixer as well. For example, in the Mackie, we also have a compressor on board the first four channel strips. The compressor compresses the dynamic range of the signal, so the difference between the softest signal and the loudest signal is reduced. This allows things to be much more even as they go through the mixer. So we can turn that up here. Not every mixer is going to have a compressor. In some cases, you can insert that as an external piece of hardware. And that's where this insert jack comes in. We plug in a Y cable. One side of the Y cable plugs into the input of the compressor. 
The other side of the Y cable plugs into the output of the compressor and brings the signal back in. So it's a way to insert an external piece of hardware into our signal flow. Again, you don't have to do that, but it's something you may want to do if you have specific processing you want to apply to a signal. Below the insert jack, we have a low cut filter. In this case, it's at 100 hertz. This allows us to take out rumble and unnecessary low frequencies in the signal that could reduce our headroom. So with our drum loop, if we engage that, we're simply cutting the bottom end. Now with a low cut filter, you want to be careful that you aren't taking out signal that you actually want to hear. So for example, in this case, it's taking out a lot of our kick drum and we may not want that, so we may not want to engage the low cut in this case. But with a vocal, there may not be anything below 100 hertz. We could certainly filter all of that out and clean our signal up even more. The next section of our mixer is the EQ section, and this is where we adjust the tone of our signals. So if we've got our drum loop coming in, we have three different controls for adjusting that. We have high frequency at 12 kilohertz, and this is our treble control. We have a mid band at 2.5 kilohertz, this is our mid range control, and a low frequency at 80 hertz, and this is our bass control. On some mixers, you may be able to change those frequencies. That gives you more flexibility for adjusting the sound. But just having these controls allows you to really shape things to make them sound the way you want them to sound, as well as to control feedback and other issues. Let's listen to the high frequency, the mid frequency, and the low frequency bands. An important concept with mixing consoles is buses. A bus is a signal path that allows you to route an incoming signal to another destination. So for example, we have our master bus. When we engage left and right down here with this switch and feed the main output, we're feeding the master bus in that case. We're creating a mix by moving these faders, and that's then sent out of that single output. We may also have the option to route to auxiliary buses. In the case of this Mackie, we have two auxiliary buses. One is labeled monitor, and it's green. The other is labeled effects, and it's yellow. So what happens is, as we turn up the knobs, for example, on the monitor bus, the signal is picked up from the channel strip. We create a separate mix, basically using those knobs. It's sent here to the master, and now that signal is routed out of the monitor send jack. A monitor send like this might be routed to monitors on stage for musicians to hear as they're playing, or you might send it to a headphone amplifier for musicians who are performing in the studio. Our second bus in this case is effects. In the case of this Mackie, there's a built-in effects processor, so we can feed that using this bus. We also have an external effects send if you want to use an external hardware processor. So when we bring up the effects send, bring up our fader, we're still assigned to left and right, we can also bring up our effects send, and we'll hear reverb from the internal processor being added to the master output. Now the effect send is what's called a post fader send. That means that it's coming after the fader in the signal path. This allows us to turn the fader down and also stop the feed into the reverb, which is very useful on stage and in the studio. If the effects bus wasn't post fader, you'd still be hearing the reverb ringing through the master output. A monitor send, on the other hand, is usually pre fader, because you don't want adjustments you're making to the faders to change the mix that's being fed to your musicians. Continuing down our channel strip, we have our pan control, which we discussed earlier, mute buttons, and then we have our assignment switches. Now we've been using left and right to feed our main output, but in the case of this Mackie, we also have a second bus, a sub 1-2 bus, and we can engage that by hitting the 1-2 switch. We can route that sub 1-2 bus to a separate output, maybe a second set of speakers, maybe to a recorder, or we can actually blend that back in with our main. So we could create a submix of all of our drums and have it on one fader and have that cascade into the main output by assigning it here. The final stop on the channel strip is our fader, which controls the channel's volume. As you see, once we've learned one channel strip, those same concepts apply all the way across the mixer. Now there are some differences in the channels here. We talked about how on channels one and two, we have mic, line, and instrument level inputs. On channels three and four, we have mic and line inputs. On channels 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, 10, we actually have stereo inputs. So we could feed a single microphone in here, or we could plug a stereo signal directly in and get both channels at once through the same channel strip. Very convenient for things like a music player or a stereo keyboard. Notice that those stereo channels don't have a compressor, but they do still have our gain control, EQ section, our two buses, pan, and so on. The final channel on a Mackie mixer is designed for music playback. So we have an eighth inch jack for a music player, but we also have a USB input, and we can engage that using the switch. 
So the channel strips are the first part of the mixer. The second part is the master section, and that's where our master fader is, a control room send for adjusting sound to speakers that might be in a studio. We also have a headphone jack and accompanying volume control, our main meters. The 48 volt switch engages phantom power, so we could use condenser microphones, which require external power with this mixer. Simply engage that by hitting the switch. Next to that, we have our sub 1 2, which is a second bus that we can either use independently or route into the main master output. We've got a fader for that. We can route it to headphones. We could blend in the USB input and so on. The third master strip over here is our effects return. This is bringing the sound back from the effects processor. It's where we adjust the returning level of our reverb, for example. We can choose to bus that to our monitors so our musicians can hear reverb on stage. And then we have our aux master as well, which we talked about earlier. At the top of the master section is our jack field. Monitor send, effects send, our main master outputs on both XLR and quarter inch. We've got control room outputs if we're using this mixer in a studio. The sub output takes its signal from the sub 1 2 fader here. Then we have our headphones and a foot switch for muting the effects engine. A mixer may or may not have built in effects. In this case, it does, the gig effects. We've got 24 different types of effects. We choose those by simply turning the knob and hitting the switch. In this case, we also have an effects mute switch, which is a very handy function because when you're talking on stage between songs, you don't want reverb on that signal. At its heart, a mixer allows you to bring multiple signals in, process them in varying ways with effects, with EQ, adjust the balance between the different signals, and control their routing. The functionality we've learned with this Mackie analog mixer is the same functionality that applies to virtually all mixers. Whether you have an analog mixer, a digital mixer, a virtual mixer running inside your DAW on your computer, all the functions are the same. The EQ, the busing, the input, the gain control, the fader, all identical functions whether you're on a huge studio console or you're on a super compact live soundboard. If you have questions about mixers, what they do, how they work, and which one might be right for you, contact your Sweetwater sales engineer or visit Sweetwater.com. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. Oh, 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 oh,